Hello and welcome back to the Outdoors Station for another audio podcast and video interview. The Outdoors Station, as you know, primarily concentrates on self-powered travel, getting from A to B using your own steam, and an appreciation and understanding of the outdoors world around us. Today, my guest is Mark Waring, who's an enthusiastic advocate for pack rafting. We had a discussion and thought it might be a good opportunity to do a couple of vid videos, this one being an introduction to pack rafting for people that may have heard about it and perhaps wanted to know more about the activity, how to get involved, how much does it cost, etc, etc. We're also going to be doing a second interview later where we're talking in much greater detail about a specific trip that Mark and his colleagues have done. And there's more of that detail towards the end of the podcast. Anything we mention during the podcast for people listening on audio only will be on the show notes on the outdoorstation.co.uk and also in the show notes on YouTube on the video, naturally. So let's now get into my conversation with Mark. So Mark, thanks very much for, for joining me. I'm um, fascinating to, to hear all about pack rafting and what actually it involves. And I think what we'll do with this conversation, because we've, we've, so we're going to have two conversations, but this conversation will be an introduction to what is pack rafting and how, can, how people can get involved in it. And we'll have a second conversation, which is more exciting about a trip that you've done recently, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. So for, so for our listeners and for our viewers who have heard the term pack rafting, what is it and how does it differ from other water sports? Okay. Uh, in, in essence, a pack raft is, is, is a relatively simple thing. Uh, it's a blow up in inflatable boats. Um, and it's, they typically weigh sort of around about three to four uh, kilograms. So by looking at its weight, you get the idea really what, what it's for. It's, um, a pack raft as a, as a waterborne craft it, it it's a compromise essentially but it's incredibly versatile you've got a rub um, a rubber boat uh, which can pack down very very small i mean some of the uh, most expensive and most advanced pack rafts in essence will get down to round about the size of a sleeping bag nowadays um so the idea really is you 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 have a uh, a craft that will put, bear you across water um, it, it's highly portable um, and it's there to complement uh, wilderness journeys or, or, or just to open up the water uh, on a wilderness journey, which, which previously, and certainly this it was in, in my case, was, was prevented you from um, crossing to the other side, to the, to the land. So, yeah, pat, pat rafts, simple thing, inflatable boat, highly portable. So... I mean, obviously, these days we've got what well, you've got stand up paddle boarding, which is inflatables. Uh, you've got inflatable kayaks, uh, sea kayaks as well. And then you've got the traditional Canadian kayak, uh, sea kayaks. And then you've got ribs, which are obviously a bigger version of a pack raft, I take it. Now, when you say they're, they're packed down that small, uh, I've vision, visualized in my mind uh, a rib, which is obviously a very heavy duty, chunky uh, piece of equipment which is quite thick in its construction with the rubber and so on. So are these fairly durable machines or uh, boats rather, or are they can, can be quite sensitive to, to naturally to, to rocks and things? Yeah, they're, they're certainly tougher than you think actually. Um, and particularly with uh, the evolution of, of materials that can combine um, lightness with, with robustness. And uh, that said, um, they're by no means indestructible and, and you've got to have a degree of care about them. I, I learned that myself uh, to my cost uh, when on a pack rafting trip in Sweden about uh, four, three, three years ago, so pre-pandemic, uh, when I, at the end of the day, tired, got out, was dragging the boat up on a shoreline and I, I dragged it over a, a rock and the sharp end of the rock sliced it. So they're not indestructible, but out. Right. No one's outdoor kit is, um, and indeed, part part of your your evolution as a pack rafter is well understanding the risk that you uh, how you can damage them, but it's also about how how you can repair them as well and and keep going on that trip. I suppose it compares quite well to 
backpacking and using perhaps more technical fabrics which although they will do the job you have to be careful not to drag them through obviously uh, bushes and uh, and such things look after your equipment so it's a learning curve i guess yeah exactly exactly that um you know with with with, with lower weights um you, you you've got to have a degree of care and caution and and how you treat your your sometimes very very expensive equipment so yeah so if you're used to main you're looking after your backpacking kit making sure that it maintains you during a long trip then you'll be fine with a pack raft as well just um just being aware at all stages of of, of risks and that that's essentially what pack rafting is about it's just about an awareness of risk and how you've got to manage it and how you mitigate it Right. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring up some pictures uh, that you've sent over to me uh, that show the pack raft that you've got and some of the uh, trips that you've been on. Uh, Would you like to just describe to people what you can actually take in a raft? Because uh, people might be visualizing it's like a kiddie uh, dinghy, if you like, that all you can do is sit in it. But it's quite, it's sort of, it's halfway between a a, a boat and a, and a canoe isn't it you've got the yeah. the spray deck and, and that sort of thing so I'll bring up some pictures while you talk about it and just show people um, actually with the sort of kit that you can carry in it while you're having your adventures okay so um, so the picture you've got here is of my very first pack craft I'm on my uh, second one now uh, it's uh, it was a, a green Nautic which uh, is, is in fact a, a Russian made pack craft even though it's a, a German brand And you get the idea of how I used to carry stuff uh, on my Nautic there, which I think is how most people start start and pack rafting. You've got a a rucksack um, and I've had some very heavy loads, rucksack loads. Um, For example, I I did a Swedish trip when I was carrying 17 days worth of food. Um, And the way that you would uh, transport it is to get it strapped onto onto the front of the boat. And because pack rafts, and this is their their beauty, but also their vulnerability. Um, they can be very, very stable craft in flat water. So you can actually load quite a lot of stuff uh, onto the front of a boat. Uh, so my, my pack craft would quite happily take me at around about 85 kilos and uh, also a, a rucksack as well at around about, you know, tw- 20 upwards with a 17 days load um, and transport us um, happily on calm benign water but then the problem comes when you you start to translate a pack raft which is um, loaded like the one that you can see there and you start to put it onto fast moving water uh, and shooting rapids as well because then you're into entering another realm of pack rafting and um, essentially a boat loaded like that you've got much more risk uh, when dealing with it because you you you're basically there's more opportunity to get caught, to get snagged. The boat is more unstable. Um, so there's a lot more danger suddenly involved with um, having a pack raft like that with the uh, rucksack uh, strapped on, loaded at the front with lots of straps dangling. So uh, to a certain extent, you, you can get around that. And my now current pack raft uh, is, a, is a much more modern one, um, more typical of the more expensive ones. And that allows you to store your kit in dry bags actually inside the boat uh, itself. Uh, how do you do that? Well, you have what's called a tie zip, which is a zip that's used on um, uh, dry suits uh, and, and uh, other such things. Uh, and that's a w- very durable, very waterproof zip. So essentially, before you inflate the boat, you can pack it inside with all your gear. So you've got a clean boat, which is a much safer boat. Uh, to paddle uh, down rapids. So that changes the way that you, you can travel using a pack raft from um, a boat that can you know, get you across relatively flat, relatively benign water uh, where entrapment is not a problem to one that essentially is going to start to perform like, like, like a kayak and that's going to let you um, access and run river systems. These uh, pictures that we've just been looking at, it just show what remote places you can get to with the with the pack raft is quite quite impressive really and they look very very remote from that point of view is there i mean it's a basic question but i've got to ask it is there any sort of licensing that you need to take into account with these things is it is it 
is there any necess- necessity for that type of thing or any need for for that sort of um, legal preparation for it or is it a very very young sport and it's still finding its way yeah it's 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 a young sport it's still finding its way but then equally um like like kayaking and, and canoeing which have been around both of them for a very long time um it it it, it, it it's it's very very similar in, in terms of that question about licensing well i think in in england and wales if you want to use your um pack raft on uh rivers uh you need to be licensed by by having i think it's the canoe association membership which gives you public indemnity insurance and, and something like that scotland of course is, is different but when you get out into the wilds of, of Europe or North America, I mean, I take mine out into uh, northern Scandinavia. I mean, that it's you've you've got unlimited rights of um, of, of access, and that that includes uh, water as well. So, as you can see from the pictures which are showing at the moment, uh, it's it opens up another world of opportunity. So, just moving from hiking, you 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 can travel on water almost effort effortlessly um and it just gives you that that other dimension and 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 a whole array of opportunities which, which are not there if you don't have a pack raft with you what's the what's the difference from a pleasure point of view using a pack raft as opposed to a canadian canoe or a kayak is there a difference because yeah, you can obviously carry you can carry stuff with a with them in a Canadian canoe, can't you? You you can indeed, but I I suppose it in a way they're two they're two different things. I mean, if you think about a Canadian canoe, um, you know, super stable craft, um, possibly what what you would choose naturally to to travel on some wild river systems because you can take a a lot of gear in it. Um, they're very agile, maneuverable. Um. And if you know how to use it, um, that that's why the voyageurs in in northern Canada essentially opened up the wilds of Canada using them. A pack raft's different, but what a pack raft enables you to do is, for a sort of weight penalty of say three to four kilos for the, for the pack raft, um, m- maybe another couple of kilos with a paddle um, and your life jacket, you can hike into remote river systems which, which are essentially locked in by by mountains or other wild land so whilst the pack raft um in essence as a as a as a watercraft is a compromise because it, it's probably not as good in itself as a kayak or, or a canoe you know try you 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 can't portage a, a kayak or canoe for, for for more than a relatively short distance whereas a pack raft you know you you, you get your rucksack pack right you add another five kilos to it, you can hike for days to get to that uh, water system that possibly no one else has ever been down before. So it's a compromise, but it's the versatility of what the craft can offer you. I suppose there's there's a certain amount of um, raw adventure in doing that type of thing, particularly in Scandinavia or, or places which, although they've been mapped and, and charted in some respects, haven't been explored or enjoyed. But is it not, I'm thinking about it from the safety point of view, it's, presumably it's unwise for somebody who's interested in doing this to start and go somewhere raw like that without a certain amount of preparation, training or experience. I, I, I completely agree with you um, there, Bob. And I think that that's the point, really. So, pat rafting is, is a is a young sport, um, but and what people are realising now is um, a pat raft is actually quite an easy thing to get into and and paddle around on on flat, stable water. And some t- people talk about the fact that their their primary stability. So, you know, you can see from the pictures that they're quite broad and they're flat. They're above water. So they can take a lot of weight and they it doesn't take much to, to paddle them and, and to sort of enjoy it. But it's their secondary stability um, where, where the problem lies. So they, they, they're not as stable, they're not as maneuverable in, um, in rapid water as, as a kayak or a canoe is. So, so they're more risky. So what, what pe- people have got to be aware of is, is Pat rafting in itself is very accessible. You can start off and have a fun day out on on easy water, but what you've got to appreciate is is the risk that that is involved in that and the inherent dangers. Um, 
you can get into trouble very, very quickly in, in, in a pack raft. So you've, you've got to start at the point that really pack rafting is a very long, steep learning curve. Um, and even the, the very top pack rafters are, are realize that and you, you, you've got to be humble on water. So I think anyone who's interested, by all means, um, have a go at pack raft, see if it's for you, see if it's something that um, pun intended floats your boat but think seriously about how you're going to improve your safety awareness, how you're going to improve your boat handling skills. So there's ways of doing that. Uh, you can learn from friends and possibly friends who are, are expert kayakers or, 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 or canoers, because a, lo a lot of the skills are, are transferable across the boats. But also, e even in the UK, there, there, there's, there's some good courses that you can go on. Um, and there's some excellent books. I could see on the screen, Bob, that you've 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 put up um, a copy uh, of the Pack Raft Handbook by by Luke Mel, which is a relatively new book. I think it's uh, was published in the last 24 months or so. Um, but many people now consider that the Bible. And Luke Mel, um, it's a fantastic book. Um, it makes learning fun, as you can see. There's really high quality illustrations in it. But what, what prompted Luke to, to write this book, and, and it's there all the way through it, is about just this risk awareness of what, what fun you can have and where you can go in a pack raft, but, but what you've got to look out for, what you've got to consider every day in, 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 in terms of assessing risk. So, yeah, pack rafting, if you're interested, get in one, give it a go. But everyone's at the start of a very long journey. Buy that book. Um, it, it will make you aware of, of the, the array of risks that, 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 that challenge all pack rafters. Um, get on a course, learn your boat handling skills, pick up tips from like-minded like people. And then if you're thinking of going out on, on, on a wilderness journey, by all means do. Ideally, go with others. Um, I mean, I, having said that, I, I, I go on my own but um, as well. But I found that... Um, uh, you you will you will open up the river more if you're with others and you've got the certainty that there there's help around um, than than if you go on your own where you you've got to naturally be more cautious and I find when I go on my own um, I spend quite a lot of time portaging which is essentially walking around a, a set of rapids uh, with with everything strapped to you so you've got to think much more on your own about again risk elimination. Mm. Well, it's it's definitely a, another level uh, to uh, to uh, transport, isn't it? You've got to look at especially water is very unpredictable. Um, yeah. I understand you were saying earlier on that Luke actually wrote this book due to a, a fatality, and and there's another website I'm just going to call up, which has got a list of fatalities and presumably where people assess what actually went wrong, so others can can learn. Yeah, that's right. So um, as I said, Luke essentially was inspired inspired uh, to, to write this book based on the experience that um, he and a friend essentially picked up pat rafting around about the same time and and they were learning really by by trial and error or or essentially by um, progressing and and not their mistakes weren't weren't they weren't being caught out on their mistakes now, what essentially happened to Luke's friend is uh, he drowned in a pack rafting accident, and and that caused Luke to 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 stop and to assess pack rafting where where his pack rafting was and pack rafting as a sport. So, as you'll see from that website that you just um, put up there, Bob, um, part of that um, process is um, he's conducted um, some analysis of reported pat rafting accidents uh, across the globe and uh, uh, he's able to draw out um, certain common themes from those accidents as well so you, you start to appreciate risk um, and and their various things essentially it's uh, uh, for example um, entrapment so that's having something on your boat such as a loose cord um, that might get entrapped when you're going down the rapid and suddenly you've got a, a, a problem which might even pull you under the surface of the water and keep you there. Or indeed, um, there, there are other accidents as well which have happened on flat water, i.e. sea, or, or, or more pertinently with Pat Ross, very large lakes, 
which have come about because you're suddenly out in the middle of this large body of water and fetch gets you what's fetch it's essentially the action of uh, wind on water huge waves um that that uh, even though you started out in flat water will will push you out of the boat and then suddenly you're a long way from help so yeah so Luke's book and, and Luke's analysis, while it seems a bit grisly looking at these pack rafting fatalities, and they're still relatively few, but I think that reflects the fact that pack, pack rafting is a young sport and um, people are only starting to pick it up. But what he's noticed as well is that the, the rate of fatalities is, is lifting up. And presumably that correlates with the fact that pack rafting is becoming more well-known, they're becoming cheaper, um, and just people are simply using it more so that whilst the, his exercise may appear a bit to be a bit grisly, it's about picking out those lessons, those learning points from each sad fatality. And, and, and so people can reflect and, and understand how you reduce risk in your pack crafting. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, I've had uh, one of my daughters has moved to, to Cornwall and uh, her children are getting involved in the surf club, as it were. And through them, I've realised just how many accidents happen on very, very simple days uh, with surfers or people just getting into difficulty in water where you assume that you're on a, a, a clean beach or a safe beach, as it were. Uh, and riptides and all the other things that water can do can, can catch you by surprise. But anyway, let's not focus on the negative. I mean, yep. it's there. And, um, you know, what do they say? Experience, that's the thing you get when you don't get what you want. So, so we look on the bright side um, and learn from other people's experiences, no matter how bad it can be. Uh, so let's get back to practicalities then. So a, a pack raft itself, uh, I think you were saying, is uh, a couple of kilos, four kilos, did you say? Yeah, yeah, it can, it, 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 yeah r roughly. I mean, it depends on, on what your budget is and what you're looking for. So you can get pack rafts, which are close to a kilogram but they're very simple and very expensive and what they're essentially there to do is to to supplement a hike so when you come across a body of water you're not going to have to hike around it but you know presumably that body of water is a lake um so it's gonna it's something that's gonna get you across a body of water and then you just pack it away again and because it's close to a kilo you you'll you'll forget about it relatively quickly okay. um okay. well but, I, what i was thinking was i just wanted to actually talk from a point of view of a complete beginner um what they would actually have to consider over and above your normal pack, backpacking hiking yeah. gear even if you were predominantly concentrating on traveling by water you still as you say got a hike there so aside from your normal uh, sleeping gear your tent your shelter and the cooking gear and and obviously the food you take with you uh, you're looking at a, a basic pack raft a paddle uh, wet weather gear or um, wet water gear whatever you call it i guess um, and helmet is that about it yeah, I think, I mean, again, it, it, it depends upon what sort of trip you're doing and, and what sort of water you, 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 you're crossing. Um, and again, going back to the issue of safety, you're always going to need a life jacket. Um, and again, the sort of life jacket that you take depends on, on, on the water you, you're going to cross. Um, flat water, there's some very good, lightweight, inflatable life jackets, but they're, they're going to be no good on, on moving water where you might get a puncture risk when you need your life jacket most. But a life jacket is, is always essential. You can't compromise on that. Helmet, you're not really going to need it on, on flat water. Um, you're going to need it though as soon as you're onto moving water because essentially you're being pushed down a river where there's lots of rocks um, quite quickly. So what what you want to prevent is is that impact um, if, if you come out of your boat. So Helmets on moving water, certainly. Um, in terms of your clothing, I started off with just using hike, hiking kit, um, and and that works to a degree. But I think you're limited more to the certainly to to the, the warmer months. The the moment you 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 sort of getting onto rapid moving water, or you're essentially going from autumn uh, to spring, so over winter, you, you're going to need a dry suit again. But to start off. Say it's June, the weather's good. You, you you could go on flat water in your hiking gear. You could probably go on moving water, but you know again, it's it's about getting wet and then being able to get dry quickly again. 
Okay, okay. So for anybody listening to this or watching this now is thinking, well, I'd like to, to give this a try and, and see if it's, they can put it on their Christmas list or birthday list or whatever. What sort of is the initial investment are we talking about? Just from a, we'll, we'll talk about from a starter point of view rather than experts because everything changes obviously over time. Um, but what, what sort of consideration do people have to think about financially? Okay, I, I would say... On, on, on a good starter pack craft, you, you're probably looking to spend around about five, six hundred pounds. That said, uh, you do get uh, secondhand pack rafts on sites um, such as eBay. Um, but yeah, it's, you've got a bit of an outlay uh, there. Um, there are some shops that um, sell X rental pack rafts, for example. So if you, you look around, you might be lucky to get a decent one for around about 300 pounds. Uh, you're going to need a paddle um, and ideally you want a paddle that breaks down into four sections so as opposed to a sort of uh, canoeing or kayaking paddle the idea really is you've got one that you can make small uh, so so it's portable um, and then with those two things and of course with the pack raft as well you need stuff like the inflation bag uh, which should come with it and also as well you're going to need um, a comfortable seat which should come with it as well but um yeah, if you want to get started, you know, I guess it's like like cycling and, and a starter bike. You would expect to spend around about six, seven hundred pounds maybe on 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 getting into cycling. And then, of course, you know, the the sky's the limit thereafter. It depends upon your 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 pockets and, and your appetite for more. And taste of lot in lycra. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> like any sort of outdoor sport yeah. these days, you're looking at if you if you said somewhere between seven hundred and a thousand quid. Um, yeah. would get you going but when you compare that to some of the super light tents which are you know five yeah. six hundred pounds uh, yeah. and decent rucksack etc it's not it's very comparable isn't it uh, now yeah. I noticed that there's a, a couple of places that do courses for people that might be interested in doing this rather than actually taking the risk of buying random equipment and, and going setting out on the, on their own as it were so I'll pull up a website which uh, perhaps you can tell us a bit more about um, which which run courses I notice and bike packing bike yeah. rafting which is another okay. aspect I guess yeah absolutely so uh, this is backcountry Scott and um, there is a guy called Andy Toop who's based up in uh, Aviemore uh, in one of the sort of uh, trading estates just outside of town um, and Andy runs um, he's got a couple of uh, strings to his bow uh, the the shop is great um go and have a look in there if you're ever around Aviemore. it's it's full of pack rafts uh, it's full of um, bikes as well and there's some generally good second third hand outdoor equipment as well and there's a lot of uh, knowledgeable and interesting people inside just to go and go and have a chat to but um as you can see with that pick a lot more lick um andy runs courses up up in the cairngorm so if you want to have a uh, you want to have a taster essentially um go go on one of andy's courses um get out onto lot morlick and, and just see if it's for you uh, you'll see that there's the bike rafting element as well and as you remember from the beginning of this conversation when i was talking about how much kit you can get on a back raft you can sort of break a bike down um you know just just take the front wheel off and you can get it onto the front of the boat and there there you go there again you, you're really accessing wild land um, and uh, human power travel really to to its ultimate degree you you can uh, bike into a wilderness area you can paddle it and you can bike out again so yeah and Andy Tupper backcountry Scott that's a good place uh, to start um, just to see if the uh, pack rafting is something for you it's actually uh, quite think, a cost, cost effective as well. I mean, ninety five yeah. pounds for a, for a day for just the basic uh, pack rafting course, and one hundred and ninety five for the bike rafting. Um, considering the amount of investment you might have to make long term, it strikes me as good value for money to get out and get a real taste for it in a in a safe, controlled way. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. And and Aviemore is a pretty easy place to access as well because it's on the mainline rail rail network um and uh yeah it's uh, uh the road as well is is good up there so um certainly something worth considering and also just to point out in in andy's sort of aladdin cave of a shop as well he he's he's got can have uh second third hand pat rafts so yeah it'd be worth 
having a go with uh, on one of his courses and then seeing what he's got in his shop and you you might find yourself starting up for a, for a relatively small outlay so we've covered the the basics then uh we've covered the safety element and looked at at obviously where how to get started in a, in a practical way um the, obviously the cost of investment which is quite nice the licensing i, I take it you don't need licensing to use um packraft in scotland no exactly yeah right so that's a great place to get going um yeah. now i know this is one conversation to introduce people to to pack rafting with uh, with some detailed points on it they might be interested in uh, all the links to everything that we've shown on the video and obviously for people in the podcast that want to follow it up it'll be on the show notes on the outdoor station website but i'd just like to ask you just to tell us a brief part about our next conversation which is going to be with you and two colleagues uh, and where you went and what we might be touching on in our next video okay uh yeah essentially uh what we're going to be doing on our next conversation is we're going to be talking about a um a more ambitious wilderness trip that that you you might aspire to after a couple of years of pat rafting uh, essentially, uh, in June of this year, uh, myself and uh, David Linton, who um, maybe a lot of people know his name, and uh, Deborah, who um, is uh, again based up in the Highlands of Scotland, we uh, embarked on a um, yeah a, 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 a good testing pat rafting journey um, up in uh, Swedish Lapland. Uh, down the River Kitem, and and essentially this trip it it it, it combined the the real elements of pat rafting. So we had a good two to three day hike uh, across rugged mountain terrain with all our gear in our packs and, and strapped to us. And then we got to um, a spectacular lake uh, called Kaitamiare, um, where we did what uh, pat rafters call is the put in. We essentially uh, got our boats ready, put our boats in, and then we began about a, a, an eight to nine day um, river journey down the River Kitem for about, about 140 odd um, kilometers. Um, and the Kitem really ha has got everything because it's uh, a, a journey with the full grades of rapids. So rapids are waterfalls uh, or, or moving water over rocks essentially, and they're graded from um, class one, which is essentially water that's rippling up to class six and you can see on the screen there that's some video i shot of the class six which we certainly didn't run uh we just went and admired it from the uh, safe uh, confines of the shoreline um but it as a river the kitem is um it's got everything it's got the full range of of experience on it um and it was a it was a proper wilderness journey I and mean, we didn't see anyone else apart from uh, the three of us uh, for well over a week until we got to Kitem village at, at, at the end of our river journey um, and uh, the conditions were testing we we started off in cold cool um, conditions and then the weather started to get very hot and then mosquitoes exploded everywhere so it yeah it it, it had everything that perhaps you know people want from from a um you know adventure. A, a wilderness journey yeah an adventure that's it excellent okay well we'll we'll hold it there and wet people's yeah. at appetite as regards the story that's coming next and we'll be doing that in the next week or so so that's fantastic excellent. so so mark indeed thank you very much indeed for your time on this i think it's been a great introduction is there anything do you think we've missed uh, possibly that people would need to know at this particular level no not not really i just think um when you when you start pat rafting it, you're you're on a on a journey in itself a, a a learning curve but you know enjoy the challenge stay humble be aware of risk and 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 just be open to the experiences of others either you know through reading books listening to podcasts there's plenty of pat rafting podcasts out there uh looking at videos on youtube or or, or courses or or, or or speaking speaking to others so just yeah Keep an open mind, be prepared to learn, and, and it's really going to give you something. It's a whole new dimension to, to, to wild country wilderness travel. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much indeed for your time, and I look forward to talking with you next time, and uh, along with Deborah and David. Okay, thanks, Bob. Well, my thanks to Mark for taking the time to explain in great detail how to get into pack rafting. And if that's whetted your appetite, as he said there towards the end, 
we will be discussing his Kitem trip in the next conversation that we have. My thanks to everyone that has given me some feedback recently and it is something I'd really like to encourage if at all possible. So when you see this video either on YouTube or Facebook or you listen to the podcast it would be great to get some sort of comments or feedbacks and just let me know that you are enjoying them and we're going down the right route. As we go into 2023 our 18th year of operation and that's, as you know, well over 550 podcasts to date. I did think I'd stop at 500, but now I'm looking at 1,000 thinking, well, it's possible, it's doable. There are a lot of interesting people out there doing a lot of crazy and interesting, stimulating things. So until next time, folks, stay tuned. We will be releasing another podcast and video next Friday. Until then, take care out there and... Bye for now. <laughs>